September 14th meeting of the Southwest Vermont Union Elementary School District. Uh, we do a quorum, it is five o'clock. Just a, a note before we begin our posted agenda, um, item number nine for executive session, the posted agenda stated that there would be action required and there is not. Um, so I, I'm gonna make the executive call and say that does not require a vote on the board. I'm simply clarifying something that was posted since we're not adding anything to the agenda. Okay, so with that said, I would uh, invite us all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, um, noting the flag in the corner. <clears throat> the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, agenda item two are is public comments. Um, Jim, are you able to see if there's anyone online? I'm gonna take one more time to look. You go to all participants. And not seeing any, but it isn't a board member or an administrator from the yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm Chris Murphy. I'm Sarah Beth. Nice to meet you, Sarah Beth. Nice to Are you here for public comments or is there some? Nope, I'm just okay, here. Very good. Yep. Well, thank you for coming. You're mm -hmm. welcome. So without any public comment, I would turn your attention to agenda item three, which is Sarah Beth, could you Richard is record is our recorder. So if you could just say your name because he puts in the minutes who's present. Okay. Go right ahead. My name is Sarah Beth. Sarah Beth. You got that, Richard? All right. So turning our attention to our consent agenda that was posted as well. It includes the minutes from, from our August 10th meeting. Uh, there were no warrants or leaves of absence or retirements. Uh, we have four resignations as posted, as well as five nominations and no field trips. So um, before we ask for questions or commentary, I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda as published. No second. We have a second from Cindy. Um, now, any discussion on the consent agenda as posted? One minute. One minute. The warrants, the payroll warrants. Okay, please. Um, I didn't see anything from Tono, and the amount was 181000 and the only thing in there for Tono was $356 for a light fiber. Normally, we get we get things from Tono. We didn't. All we have is anything. Is that the budget control sheet you're looking at, or is that um, what the other documents? Yes. We do have Renee. Yes. Okay. Two, so, so, so. Renee, I don't know if you heard um, Cindy's question. No, I'm sorry, Cindy. Are you looking at the budget status control document or the warrant? It's the, um, it says, yeah, payroll, check registered. So I think it's the budget status report she's looking at, Renee. So the payroll warrant, um, it, it should say SVU ESD at the top, PR204 in handwriting. It does say the Southern Vermont Union Elementary SD. Yeah, so if you're looking at the payroll warrant, the majority of the payments actually go through what is referred to as an ACH. So those are direct deposits. So that's the second from the last line on the payroll warrants. It does say check number is ACH and then the description is voucher. That's the amount um, of the, the payroll warrant. And then on the there's another one too. So it's there's 204 and 205. The one that's numbered 205 has um, significantly more um, folks on there. So those are either people that have just joined um, the district and haven't had their direct deposit set up yet. Um, and then of course we have all of our, you know, taxes and our insurance payments are also part of, part of our payroll. But again, from the, the second line from the bottom is the ACH and that's the voucher of the direct deposit. So that would be the cumulative amount of our um, payrolls for that one payroll as well. So, Director Gordon, uh, the, the document that Cindy is looking at is the budget status report. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what I was looking for, normally we have four or five pages from Pownal. 
and the, out of the 181,722, there's only one item that says Pano for $356 for first light fiber. So that, that would be our phone system. And it could just be, and I'll, I'm trying to pull it up here, Cindy, so I can look at it at the same time. But the descriptions, because we're on this new system and with the, um, you know, the union district now, we have to kind of look probably more so at the, the budget unit. So any anything that starts with a 1001 and then a 106 is attributed to Pownell Elementary School. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull it up here as well. I think, for instance, Cindy, let's say you go to page 31 of that. Um, the last, you have the last sort of chunk of the, the lines on page 31. Um, I don't have a page. Mine goes to 10. I can I'll, I can print you a copy and bring it up right oh, now. I'm sorry, I do see what you're looking at. You're looking at the okay. I'm sorry, we were. Yeah. Renee is in the building. Okay, so what you're so the the pages that you have are the attachments are attached to the warrants that need to be signed. They come from the budget status report, which is a larger document, which was in the packet that was uh, that we had the link to. That has the line items uh, assigned for panel set out by line item number instead of by the name panel. Um, so if you look at the budget status report, which is another document that was in the packet, it has all the things that I think, I think what you're describing. Correct. The, the budget status report is a document that um, I'm look, looking at from the website is 63 pages long. Um, the panel charges start Oh, let's see, music, direct instruction. So it starts on page 31 is the direct instruction for Pownell Elementary School. And then the next several pages are all Pownell um, expenses until you get to page 39. And that's when it transitions. The last item there is um, Pownell Elementary School Kitchen. And then it uh, transitions to Shaftesbury Elementary School on page 39 of the budget staff report. Those are the ones I don't have. Question. Okay. Um, I can, I'll, I'll link those here right now to me to see if you can have them look at them. Would you like to take a look at them on my computer right now? It's uh, pages 32 to 39. Why they're looking at? It. Can I just ask a quick question, uh, Renee? It's Jeff. Um, the Kansas State Bank. What's that for? That's a large sum of money. It's on page three. Um, that's probably our lease payment for Chromebooks. Okay, so it's like thirty-three thousand dollars. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And why would you go with Kansas State versus a local bank? We actually put our financing out to bid. Okay. So whoever gives okay. us the best interest rate is what we go with. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions regarding the warrants or any other elements of the consent agenda? Okay. And I did send you that link, at least your email, so you can take a look at it later if you need to. Okay. So, um, Hearing no further conversation, um, there is a motion on the floor. So all those in favor of accepting the consent agenda as published, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 I think that's all. I think that's everyone. Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much. All right, so that moves on to finance. And since Director Gordon is, has already been speaking to us, I'll, I'll turn over the floor to you again, Renee. If you could please take us through those. 
Um, I think the only thing that we have is just the treasurer's report. Is that what's on the agenda? Yes, yes, because the rest weren't available with the early date. Yeah. And you know what? I don't I don't think there it has been posted, to be honest. So okay. there isn't actually any action to take on that agenda item. Superintendent Culkin, I'm going to ask you a question regarding Robert's rules for this sort of thing. Do we need to officially table that or can we simply address it at the next meeting? The treasurer's report? Yeah. So technically, you don't even have to accept the treasurer's report. That's a practice that boards have done, but it is their report. It's not, not yours. So I know that legal has advised us before that it's it's not something you have to do, but so you could table it, but okay. it's not, there's no harm. The report is the report. So it's not like you hold anything in balance. Yeah. So since we do not have to even legally do it, we will not table it. We'll simply pick it up uh, next time. Uh, so the next agenda item is policies. Um, the policy committee did not meet this month. We were slated to meet yesterday and that uh, got called off. So there's now nothing to share there, which brings us right to the superintendent's report. Um, yeah, the policy committee was uh, felt that with the little recent surge we've had or wave, uh, that uh, we would not bring people together here until and we'll shoot for October and hope that things are better there. Um, so, since so speaking of COVID, you know what has been the impact that um, that we are seeing? A um, lot of confusing numbers out there. You know what what is a wave? What is a surge? I'd say that um, and when I wrote this. Uh, on September 14th, we had 17 confirmed positive cases throughout uh, the elementary and the high school district. Um, I'd say we're probably over 20. Did not have a report of one today, yesterday, or Friday, but um, that's positive news. But you know, I'm not totally in a relaxed position on that yet. Um, and I just want to point out, so 20. Sounds like a high number. We have over 3,200 students and staff members. You know, that's, you know, slightly over 20 positive cases out of 3,200. So I don't, but the impact it has is on the, um, when the, the nurses do the contact tracing of how many students have to quarantine and we're following the AOE guidance uh, on quarantining and contract tracing that the OE released in the end of August. And that's what is, you know, impacting. There were, uh, we had to close Powell Elementary School for one day because the contract tracing, because of the time the case was reported, we couldn't get it done in time for school to open in the morning. At least not that I was confident that we wouldn't create further exposure because the nurses just could not get um, through. And I have to, I, I'm going to say it every time, I have to commend our school nurses. I have to commend our COVID-19 coordinator, Ashley Walker, who the, the sheer volume of, um, you know, at one point, Pondell Elementary had over 60 people quarantining one day. And uh, district-wide, at one point, we approached, you know, well over 200. Um, School can go on. The, the, the guidance we're getting from the AOE, as long as I have 50% of the students physically in place, physically in the building, the day will count. So we haven't, we haven't, um, there was one day that Powell came, we were concerned it was going to come close, but it didn't. And uh, we're seeing slight decline in cases right now. As I just mentioned, we've had three days without a positive case. Um, so I'm hoping that this was more related to this. You know, a wave that came in with the startup of school. Um, I, I, by and large, uh, the students have been very cooperative about wearing masks. Um, we have um, entered into discussions with the um, Teachers Association about requiring quarantining, uh, requiring vaccination. They are, I have to credit them that they are. Um, um, willing to discuss that and create a memorandum of understanding uh, that then they will bring to their membership and we will bring to, uh, to boards and we're trying to fast 
track that, that by the end of this month that we could have something to present to boards that um, would require our staff uh, to quarant uh, to be vaccinated. So uh, that that's a pause. I, 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 I suspect that the vaccination rate among our staff is pretty high, but you know we want to get to the 80%, at least if not 100%, so that uh, we can ease back on some requirements. Um, concerns that we've heard from parents are, the, are those points where like, students have to wear masks inside the building. They don't have to wear them outside. You can take your mask off in the cafeteria. That I, I'll acknowledge that that is a concerned area. How do you keep people distant that they can eat with their mask off and then put their mask back on? Very difficult. And I'll, and I'll stress this, and this sounds like a weak excuse. It's guidance that we're getting from the AOE. It's not a directive. It's not, we're not under a state of emergency. As I have told the principals, let's do the best we can to physically distance people while they're eating with their mask off. But by not allowing remote learning, the option of us doing a, B days like we did last year so that I only have half the population in the building. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying I want to go to that, but that would be the only way that we could reduce the amount of people that are in the cafeteria. As it is, mass principles, that is, as much as possible, if it works in your school, let students eat in classrooms, try and do that to reduce how many are in the cafeteria. That does create a supervision problem because, you know, I, I can't have I don't have enough staff to watch students eating in the cafeteria in the classroom. So we continue to monitor that. Uh, and I, again, I'm just, um, the amount of time that your nurses put in nights and weekends making phone calls, doing contact tracing is, is, uh, is commendable. And I, I can't thank them enough. And the stress that the, them, that they have been dealing with with them uh, uploading that information to the Department of Health so that, you know, they can the state can have the data of what these cases are is, is a lot of work. It, 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 it's not something that's done quick. So that's what happened with why we had to close, make the decision to close pound. Remember, we do a calendar of 180 school days. The requirement by the state's 175. So, you know, as long as we don't um, go deeper down that road. And there would be the uh, Secretary of uh, Education, French did say that you know, after February, there would be waivers available. You could apply for a waiver if we did drop below the 175, but right now I'm thinking that um, we should be okay with it, so. Any questions specifically to our COVID response? Yeah, yeah I had, um, Tammy and I are representing town and I know it's all, we're all under one umbrella, yeah. but I, I, is there any way we can be notified, let us know, but like, I'm surprised. I didn't hear that we had 60 in one, yeah. in one day. I feel disconnected from mm -hmm. Carmel and I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows I'm not happy with F46 anyways, yeah. but I'm trying to adjust to it. So you did get a, a series of emails from me that showed all the notifications that we did, but we never, you know, the numbers that I'm telling you tonight is not something that we normally, I, I don't normally publish how many people are quarantining. Um, uh, or positive cases, we don't identify whether they're a student or staff member because we want to try it. Right. You know. and I don't need so, to know. But you, you did get my emails right from all our notifications. Of, you know. So I will. Um, my other question is got nothing to do with COVID. Well, I guess it yeah. does. Are the town students arriving? I just found out late last year that they didn't arrive until 9, 930. That was that was last year. We were doing a delayed start that allowed teachers to deal with uh, students who may have been working remotely, but they're on normal operating normal. time this year. Yep, we're back to normal op normal operating school hours this okay. year. But last year we did delayed start, and Wednesday was a remote day for all students. We're five days a week with normal operating hours. Okay. Just, there's just sometimes I just feel totally disconnected, yep. and then I do. I do check in with Linda. Yeah. Well, you're welcome to contact me. I, I mean, I've been trying to email you all when we do have a case. There might be some that miss, uh, I miss to you, especially when we get really swamped with volume. But um, I, I, I believe I've sent you most of the announcements. So I might have missed one or two of you know, the letters that go to parents. So um, one question, Jim. Yeah. 
Jeff, what, that, yeah. what, what's going to happen when we have these kids who quarantine, especially after repeat exposures? Because some kids, you know, I know there's, you know, three or four kids in one class that go out. When they come back, there's a chance they can be re-exposed again. I mean, you're looking at some kids could miss up to, you know, realistically 10 days per month. I mean, how is it going to impact their free um, education? Yeah. I mean, because we're not providing any remote stuff for direct instruction to these children, so they're for falling further behind. Am I correct right. saying that? They're accessing Google Classroom and instruction. The teachers are putting uh, instruction material up there for they can stay connected. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done some remote learning, depending on like, I can do remote learning with like a class if that class is out. Um, yep. But the whole school cannot go remote. That that's what the state is not allowing. So, uh, it, it certainly is a concern with uh, what that will be made. Uh, you know how we will make that up. Uh, but that's what our recovery plans are for for all students, and we will continue to monitor that. And if we need to use um, additional um, um, resources, it's not the word I was for, but additional means to address that, you know, if, if a principal reports that there's a concern about students that are missing significant chunks, then we'll, we'll see what we can shift to, to address that. And I'm hoping that it's not going to be, I mean, I, I have, uh, I have only heard one report of a multiple, um, of multiple um, quarantining and, <laughs> and there is some great debate going on in Vermont right now on quarantining and, uh, you go across the border in New Hampshire, there is no quarantine, there is no contract, contact tracing. Now, I'm not saying that that is the method that we should, we should go, but um, the, and I've expressed my concern to the Secretary of Education that the, the method that we're using right now is not sustainable. If, it, if, if, we, if this wave is the, the state is calling it, not a surge, if it continued or it looked like it was not downward like when which it seems to be doing right now um but three days doesn't make a trend um maybe we we won't have to address that okay but certainly Thank aware you. of it yep so superintendent Culkin, if what happens from a from a contractual standpoint if if one school needs to close often enough that it falls below the 175 day threshold that the state requires what happens how do we how do we have staff in the building beyond the contracted number of teaching days how do we have administrators in the building beyond that has that been reckoned yet well if the schools closed and the staff would not be working that day so they would okay. still owe us that time unless we you know apply for a waiver we'll we'll see what the total count is when we get to that more towards the end of the year and see if we even have to i'm hoping we don't have to apply for a waiver that will use less again this has happened in the past for non-correlated, you know, like a couple of years ago, the middle school had a pipe burst. They, we had to close the school. The middle school did not make up those days because we were still over 175. And uh, Woodford was closed a day this year because of a septic yeah. uh, issue. And, you know, they'll still be over there 175. So I won't, uh, as superintendent, say, Woodford, you need to go an extra day now. The reason we wouldn't do that is the buses are contracted for a certain amount of days. So I would have to find busing for them on that extended day because okay. the bus, the buses ran that day. They they did their contractual okay. obligation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, just because I, I, I'm realizing I don't know, are school nurses supervisory union employees or district employees? They're, they are uh, district employees. Okay. okay. Yeah. I didn't realize. It. Thank you. They're members of the collective bargaining unit and uh, Again, they're weekends, nights, and uh, putting in a lot of extra time. Um, the other issue that some of you may be hearing about is transportation. Um, we had some snags with busing at the opening of school. Uh, I attribute it to two, two things. Um, we're waking up out of the sleep of remote and COVID, and it had been quite some time before buses ran on a, on a normal schedule at a normal time. Uh, like as Cindy pointed out, last year they were running an hour later, so there was some adjustment to get it on schedule. I did ask um, Renee to give me a report today. Um, 
Renee, do you mind if I, do you want to, rather than me read what you gave, if you have it in front of it, you want to tell me what the uh, update on transportation, that's what you, that's what happens when you show up at the meeting. I see you and I said like, why should I read the email you sent me on transportation? So. And look at the smile. Every time you call her name, she smiles. <laughs> that's because she, she loves to talk to you. Do you have it or do you want me to do it? No, no, I, I'm just trying to pull it up here. Sorry. <laughs> The good news is I think we're out we're we're well on our way to correcting it. I'm not we're not getting individual buildings are getting complaints, but here we're not getting the volume of phone calls we're getting the first few days that like missed the bus, the bus went by my stop, the stop has changed. Parents calling where's the buses going? were running really early. I'm sure you got calls. Renee, that's your warm-up. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so <laughs> like like Jim said, um, it's definitely been a shift from last year, right? Because we had so many families that were actually transporting their students. So now we don't have any restrictions on the buses. The bus routes were designed for all of our students, whether or not they, are gonna, they ride or they were going to get transported um, by parents, exclusive of those students that live in the walk zone, of course. Um, we have seen some issues with um, just that commingling of buses and parent pickup and drop off that we're trying to flush out um, issues at the school level and the administrators have been working hard on that. Um, just a couple of issues, I think, with address changes, you know, the, the schools are working through those as well. Um, we are allowing students to um, use alternate drop-offs this year. So if Johnny wanted to go to Jimmy's house after school and he gets a bus pass, that's okay. Um, so that's a big change from last year as well. And then- um, Buses are at full capacity. And we, we do have them, yep, scheduled, you know. So if, if every student were to ride every single day, we're, we're sure that there is enough space for those students. But if there are extra students coming on, we could see capacity issues, but of course, you know, not every student is in school every day. We have students that are participating in after school programs and athletics. So, you know, there's a, a large fluctuation um, in daily ridership. Um, but it has been mentioned that, um, you know, masks continue to be somewhat of a concern that not all students are abiding by wearing their mask. Um, and we're, we're requiring that because it's a CDC guideline that any public transportation. So whether you're on a bus, a train, an airplane, you have to have a face covering on. So all of the buses have um, face masks for students that uh, show up at the bus stop without one, their child size and their adult size, depending upon the student, but um, they are required in school and they are required on buses. Thank you, Renee. When I said capacity, I didn't mean, if you want to recall from last year, we were limited to how many students we could carry on a bus. So uh, this year, there is no limit other than what the capacity of the bus is and um, uh, that we've been able to offer those services again that, that we weren't able. Should make it easier. Yeah. Sure. And then another update that I have before I get into a couple of positive things. The other is uh, I thought the board would make more interested in, um, you've, you've seen the news every, Every organization is looking for help, you know, not enough workers. So um, our director of human resources here today, and he's gonna tell you what open positions still exist in the, uh, in the Union Elementary District. Nick? How's it going? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we are, we're actually in a much better place than we were um, at the time the Bennington Banner asked for, you know, information to release their article. Um, as of right now, we've filled all um, classroom teacher positions in all of the elementary school buildings. Uh, we have a recent resignation for a secretary position at one of the elementaries that we're looking to fill. Um, we have a social worker position that we are looking to fill that's an SVU ESD position that supports on point. Um, and we have a couple SVSU positions that are located in elementary schools, such as math coach and literacy coach positions. Um, we have a school psychologist that supports the elementary schools and some special education and paraprofessional positions. Um, we've done a, a tremendous amount of hiring. I should say the schools have done a tremendous amount of hiring. So uh, we could certainly be in a, in a worse situation. I think we're, we're uh, very close to fully staffed 
um, especially when it comes to classroom teachers, um, which is critical. And things are looking, you know, overall, um, um, very good, I would say. We still have some need and a couple positions that need to be filled, um, but big, a big push was made to, to get up to, to fully staffed, and we're, we're almost there. Yeah, and if Nick, you could address, because you played a big part in this, uh, I had told the board in an email that uh, we we're struggling to, for a temporary fill with the nurse at Bennington Elementary and uh, the, uh, the solution that you put together. Yeah, so we, uh, we spoke to the nurses at the high school. There are three nurses, two that support the main building and one that supports um, some interventions um, at the high school. And we were able to shift resources around uh, so that one of them was able to come and provide support. I'm sorry, I can hear my children. I uh, was able to come and provide support to Bennington Elementary while, um, their, um, while that need exists. We also recently received a potential lead from a contracted service that we might be able to uh, to work with that would release that nurse back. But uh, they stepped up. Uh, all the nurses are stepping up, but um, those at the high school stepped up to cover uh, so that one could come to Benning Elementary um, until we're back to uh, to regular staffing levels there. We did have a retired nurse return uh, on a temporary hourly basis to. Uh, assist our nursing staff with um, the contact tracing. So that hopefully is gonna take um, some pressure off of them. So, the, the, so I wanna thank um, the nurses again for shifting and being flexible and realizing the need and how dangerous it would have been to have that school without a nurse. So um, thank you, Nick. Um, so on a, on a positive note, I've asked the, um, the Assistant Superintendent Laura Boudreau to, to address you tonight about something that will be starting at the end of this month that um, some administrators and staff will be participating in and in a year long study. Laura? Hi, everybody. Hi. Nice to see everybody in lots of different ways. Uh, so um, I'm excited to share that as part of the work to support recovery, which is an ongoing multi year. Uh, process, uh, the Vermont Superintendents Association is um, sponsoring a um, leadership systems development series, and it's all around um, looking and enhancing your system to support all students. Um, the the, the statement is um, linked to Vermont's Act 173, which is um, working towards full implementation, which is an act relating to enhancing the effectiveness and availability and equity of services provided to students who require additional support. So this initiative is gonna focus on that implementation and allow our leadership team uh, to take a, a, a deeper dive into um, designing our own system. So it's going to help us look at our own multi-tiered systems of support and really focus on how we support all students to make sure that all students have access to good first instruction. And then they get more and more. And so Dr. Katie Novak of Novak Educational Consulting, who has partnered with the Vermont Superintendents Association, um, will provide uh, this training to um, our, our leadership team. And then the really cool part, and this is kind of an outcome of COVID, we'll get our own, our district, um, as well the other districts from around the state, we'll get our own coaching sessions um, with Dr. Novak. So we'll be really able to focus in on our own system and what our needs are. Um, and, and so it's, it's just an opportunity as we're coming out of the pandemic, knowing that we really need to look at our system and how we're using our resources. Uh, this is an opportunity to look at, um, again, going back to what's best practice in um, looking at uh, focusing on all of our students and um, making sure that they're all getting what they, they need. So um, our, the leadership series um, will start on September 30th. And then we will have an hour coaching session um, monthly, and then we'll reconvene. I think the other cool thing, and what I love about Vermont, um, is that we're small enough that um, many, many districts, most districts from around the state are involved. So we'll have opportunities to partner with other districts to learn what's working for them. Um, we'll be able to share with them. Um, so they're, they're really uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to collaborate. So. Uh, we're just excited to be, um, we were accepted into the, our district we accepted in and to be part of this 
um, program. So that's to be celebrated. And we're looking forward to sharing our work with you as we move forward. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank Laura, you. just be clear, you're breaking up a little. The 30th is not a one hour coaching session. That's an all day event. That's all day. Yeah, right. all day. Right. Good. That's a quick question, Laura. We came out of the uh, state study when they did uh, present in front of the, uh, you know, uh, the House and Senate, right? But they did a big study on what best practice was and what current practice was in the state. So is the plan to move during the, do the best practice that was uh, proposed during that um, the, uh, hearings? So, I, so Jeff, I'm not exactly sure what you're referencing, but I will say what you said in there, I can, I can latch on to is that we, we are, Every district is required to have a multi-tiered systems of support that um, reflects um, best practice in link to academics, behavior, and yeah. social emotional learning. And so they do monitor us. And so I'm sure that there'll be carryover. And um, I'll be looking forward to that initial session mm -hmm. when to, to see what they're referencing that they're going to have us use as guides. So that will be great to report back, Jeff. OK, because I know when they did the Act 173, they had the big hearing. And they mm -hmm. presented a lot of data and they had a huge manual that they went through. Yeah. Um, you know, that really addressed it. And they had the three categories like current practice, best practice. So yes. our goal is to move towards the best practice that was proposed oh, in that manual. Yeah. So yeah. So and if Jeff, you're referring to the five, so you try so part of the data that Act 170, part of what the outcome was the district management group study. Yes. It had five key points. Yes. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And for those of you, I can big thick manual. Yes, I can, and just Jeff is what Jeff's referencing is these five key pillars, um, which I can share with you. Um, it's to ensure elementary tier one core instruction meets the needs of most students, provide additional instructional time outside core subjects aligned to core instruction to students who struggle, rather than providing interventions instead of core instruction, ensure students who struggle receive all instruction from highly skilled teachers, Create or strengthen a systems-wide approach to supporting positive student behaviors based on expert support. And number five, the fifth pillar, is provide students um, having more intensive support needs with specialized instruction from skilled and trained experts. So that was from the district management group study. And so thanks for um, bringing that up, Jeff. You're welcome. And I had it right in front of me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. The uh, last thing I wanted to speak to you about is um, this Thursday begins our equity speaker series. Very excited about this and proud that the SU is doing this. And I'll read you from our brochure. Our goal is to bring a diverse group of speakers to the SVSU to share their lived experiences and professional expertise linked to equity. The series has been curated to represent a wide range of marginalized identities and causes representing both our diverse staff and student body. And the first speaker is this Thursday. I sent you all an email. Board members are welcome to join us. You have to use your SBSU email to come in so that we recognize who it is coming in. So this is based on uh, the speakers that we have there. So these aren't open to the public. They're open to staff and board and administrators. So uh, the first one, September 16th at 3.30, is uh, Bora Yang, who is the executive director and legal counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And she is going to speak to the SBSU faculty and staff about the work of the Vermont Human Rights Commission and what brought her to this work and the individual and collective action that needs to happen in, within Vermont. So I did send you the, the link to the whole speaker series, but if, you know, let me know if you need it. Let me know if you wanna join and you're having trouble. Remember what your SBSU uh, email is because many of you, uh, your other email is behind it. So, uh, but I can double check with that for you so that we, you may send it to us. And when we send it to you, it links to your other one. Some of you have done that, your own personal one, but we don't send it directly to your personal email. And uh, not to pick any on anybody, but I see Melissa Chancy here. I don't know if she <laughs> wants to say hello. She is your um, Woodford. Elementary School Building Supervisor. Hi, everyone. Congratulations. Hi. How's the first couple of weeks going? First three weeks going? Went to three weeks. Uh, first three weeks were going. First day was tough. As you said, we had to close for a septic issue on our second day. But once we got past that, we're rolling along. Thank you. 
And uh, you know, we have Elizabeth Grunberg, new principal at Bennett Elementary. We have Sarah Case, assistant principal, new assistant principal between Pownell and uh, Shaftesbury. Kristen Thompson, new assistant principal at Molly Stark, and Melissa here. And uh, we'll, I think we, the chair and I, should talk about how we're going to get in a hybrid meeting, maybe how we invite them to come so that you can meet and greet them in a future meeting. So I was hoping and that uh, that concludes my report. Great. Um, Jim, I'd actually like to go back and just chat with Nick a little bit. Uh, yeah. He's, Director still, Galt. he's still here. Yep. Director Galt, are you still around for us? I am here. Great. Just wondering if you could speak to a little bit about the recruitment efforts that are, I'm sure, are happening now and, and will be ongoing so we can fill both the SU positions and the ESD positions. Yeah. So, you know, the postings for this year started in the spring. Um, when I look back on our school spring postings, uh, noting that some of these were repeat postings. Um, I end up on page four, uh, which is 25 postings per page. Um, so we, we posted about 100 positions. Again, some of those are repeats. Um, when I look at the, the nominations that have been brought to the board so far for, for this school year, we're right at almost 100. Um, that does include some new positions through ESSER. I think 13 or so positions, Laura, something like that, that are ESSER related positions for the SESU board. Also some positions that um, were essentially frozen, if you will, from last year. So certainly more than normal, but um, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this goes to the principals. They're the ones doing most of the legwork. They're the ones doing the interviews. They're the ones um, forming their search committees and doing a lot of the work to move away from my one-year-old. Um, <laughs> I think you should pick the one year off and yeah. introduce us. Yeah, uh, he's uh, he's eating a hot dog. So um, <laughs> it is. Uh, I have to say, like I said, most of this work is being done by the principals, the committees that they form uh, with their staff. Um, you know, we use multiple sources: School Spring, Indeed. Um, we're reaching out to colleges directly about you know recent graduates and things like that to try to find these candidates. And given the circumstances, the, the kind of small candidate pools um, and the, you know, the higher the normal number of resignations, uh, we, we really have made, you know, kind of tremendous progress, I think, in getting, uh, in getting these positions filled. Uh, you know, some of them right up to the last minute. I mean, we're still hiring right now um, and we'll continue to do so uh, until we're fully staffed. Um, but yeah, the principals, I have to say, the principals and their committees that they form have done a, you know, a lot of this work. Um, and we're supporting He's being them. modest. He really is under, you know, how much work it is for him to onboard almost 100 staff members. So. Yeah. Thank you. They're the ones yeah. doing all the, the front end work. So. Great. Um, any other questions for our superintendent? Okay, great. So moving on. Um, so the chair report. Uh, the first thing I, I, this, I haven't considered this until just now. Um, I'm hoping we can have a motion from the board to empower our clerk to just send little, just, just notes of acknowledgement to our school nurses. Um, I know little notes, you know, don't make the work any easier or any, any more doable, but maybe it's something. And uh, I would entertain that motion and we can direct. I think they would appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Cindy. Can I have a second I'll that motion? Thank you, Susan. Any discussion about um, the motion on the floor? No, I think it's very no. important. You know, it make It'll make them more appreciated. I hope so. I, I hope they I hope they'll feel that way. Um, great. So all those in favor of empowering and directing our clerk to send letters of acknowledgments to our school nurses, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that carries. Thank you very much. Scott, you're the clerk, correct? Yes, yes that's right. And, and Nick is saying we could Nick could get you the contact information and names of who's in each building. Great. Nick, right? You could do that for Scott. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Great. And I just, I mean, in terms of the, the chair, I want to echo much of what has already been said, just an appreciation for um, the staff in all of our buildings and in central office for making this work. I know there, there's a lot, there's just a lot of emotion around COVID um, and a lot, a lot of other sorts of feelings as well that have, that have crept into this public health situation. Um, but it seems that everyone has an opinion, uh, whether it's it's informed or not. And schools are some of the people, some of the agencies and organizations that need to deal with all of that. And I think our schools have done a tremendous job in making that happen so far. 
And I anticipate they'll continue with all of that really hard and really crucial work. Um, so I just want to say thanks to that. We did uh, at the last meeting talk about re-examining re, uh, re our use of school resource officers in this now enlarged uh, elementary school district. And because the timing wasn't great for that idea because we were starting school and now we have all the COVID stuff, but it is an idea that I would like us to revisit soon, if not next month and the month afterward, we can get school underway. Um, but I do want us to have time to have a thoughtful conversation about it, and make a thoughtful decision about it, so that if we need to potentially make changes to next year's budget, we can do that and do it with enough time that Director Gordon and all the other folks in the business office can make that happen. Yeah. Cindy. Are they in the buildings now? Some of them. Yes. In some buildings they are. In um, Connell and in Shaftesbury. But in the three elementary schools in Bennington, for instance, we just have not had the staffing to have a body there um, consistently. The very other school that has a school or resource officer in the SU is the middle school. High school does use police officers from the details, but they're not school resource officers. Right. And I think in particularly, well, one element that I want us to pay attention to is that there is a difference between being a school resource officer and being a police officer and doing police work. And I think particularly when it comes to the elementary school level, the, the, the philosophy behind the, S, the, the idea of there even being an SRO is to have that specialized training. Um, and there are a whole lot of other reasons that I think have come to the forefront of community consciousness in the last few years that just weren't there or weren't as readily apparent to everyone um, you know, three or four years ago when the BSD first started having the SRO conversation. Yes. Yeah. So uh, and then and then when when Act 46 took took it became into effect because BSD had SROs built into its budget because of equity, like we said, okay, well now everyone has SROs built into their budgets, and we spend a ton of money. We have a lot of money allocated. We don't spend as much as as is allocated because we don't have the staffing. And just I think the philosophical arguments behind it, behind the SRO. Uh, have potentially shifted. And I just want us to be thoughtful about um, the folks who are in our schools, the way we're spending our taxpayer money. Uh, I want us to be aware of that. I think it's important that we talk about it. Yeah. So I, I, I think we'll put it on the agenda for next month. We'll probably put it on the agenda again in November um, to give ourselves time to do it carefully, to, to, to do the conversation carefully. I know I've gotten several phone calls from okay. the taxpayers. Yeah. Thank you. At first, it's not for credit for the taxes going down. I said, no, excuse me, for two years in a row, we were 10%. This year, we were 1%. Mm -hmm. and it showed up in our taxes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was happy to be able to tell the people. Yeah, great. OK. All right, well, that does it for the chair's report. Um, the budget status report was posted. Um, the SBSU of student enrollment was not posted, but the budget status report was. Um, we had a discussion about that at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so having exhausted items one through eight of our agenda, I would entertain a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to one Vermont statutes annotated subsection 313A3 and section one Vermont statutes annotated subsection 313A1, E, and F. Please, I would entertain that motion. Thank you very much. And the first, we have a second. Any discussion? To ask okay. the board to, if they wish to invite the director of HR in. Yes, the, the idea would be to invite both the director of HR and our attorney, and our, our district mm -hmm. attorney. Yes. Not the district attorney, but our district okay. attorney. Okay, very good. Um, so the motion is on the floor. We've had a discussion. All those in favor of the motion to move into executive session for the stated reasons, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The abstentions, okay, the motion passes because there is no action required. Anyone who's decided to watch from home or certainly if you'd like to stick around until we're done and come back, you're welcome to do so. But when we come back, the only thing we'll be doing is closing the meeting. So it's up to you. I think I'm all good. All right, very good. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.